What good is it if an individual gains the world but loses the soul? That's sort of the topic of today's Bold and Blunt. And I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. And of course, that question comes right from biblical teachings, right? Specifically, it's from the book of Mark. And let me read you those couple of lines from the King James Version. It goes like this. Four. Oh, wait, before I get into all that, I want to quickly mention, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app. At Real Life Network, that is the online faith-based news platform of Pastor Jack Hibbs's church out in California. At WashingtonTimes.com, where you may also subscribe to my three times a week newsletter, comes out Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Just go to WashingtonTimes.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, find the newsletter section, click on it, and click on Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley. That's me. Sign up for my newsletter. You will get my commentaries that I write all day long at the Washington Times, as well as my Tuesday and Thursday Bold and Blunt podcast with, I got to say this, the best guests in America and in parts outside of America. Yes, I speak with people from Israel, from Britain, all over the world, right? You got to listen, got to listen in. And please subscribe if you are already a subscriber. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. And if you don't want to go go to all that trouble, you can just go and do a Bing search or Google search or Duck, Duck, Goose, Go, whatever it's called, search. And click on Bold and Blunt, Cheryl Chumley. It's available anywhere podcasts are available. So back to the Bible, right? Merry Christmas. Well, as I'm speaking of the Bible, Merry Christmas to you and yours. But back to the Bible, Mark. Or as my friends in Boston might say, Mark, Mark. There's a shout out to my good friend in the Boston area. And for the rest of you listening, again, this is from Mark 4. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It seems a pertinent time with the holiday season upon us, Christmas season upon us, the birth of Jesus season upon us to look at that question. Because if you look at America, right? America, America is an exceptional nation founded on a quest for religious freedom made exceptional by the idea of individual rights and freedoms coming from God and that government is only in place to preserve and protect what God gives each and every individual. That's the greatness of America. That's what's so great, so special, so exceptional about America. But of course, there's a negative side too. There is a dark side. And with freedom comes responsibility. As a matter of fact, Founding Fathers warned us that we would not stay a government that is limited in scope if the people, if the citizenry, were not moral and virtuous, because it's only those who are moral and virtuous who are capable of self-governance. People who are immoral, they need laws, they need someone forcing laws onto them. They need somebody telling them what to do. They need somebody holding them accountable for when they stray from morality. But those who take their moral marching orders from above, from the Creator, from the Bible, from Judeo-Christian principles, are a lot more capable of self-governance than those who are atheists, those who are secularists, those who just scoff and mock at the idea of any sort of higher power and eventual accountability. So when you look at America, though, the negatives of it, we also have a free market system, a capitalistic system that allows creativity to flourish and prosper the individual. And the way I look at it is this. Each and every individual is granted by God or gifted by God certain talents, skills, gifts, right? We all know, well, we all who read the Bible know that the Holy Spirit gives gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
But we also have certain talents in life that God gives us, whether you're a writer or a speaker or a craftsman or what have you. you. You have talents that are yours and yours alone, and they come from God, right? And once you discover those talents, it it sort of gives you a pathway to how you were supposed to proceed in life because you use those talents or you're supposed to use those talents to glorify God. That's the basic reason, right? To glorify God, to strengthen the church, to shine your light in a very dark world. In America though, with our free market and capitalistic system, which is the greatest allowance for individuals to use those talents for God's glory. You can't use your talents in a communist system because the communists just want to steal them away and use them and, and exploit them for the state. So it's it's in free economies that you can actually utilize those God-given talents for his glory and to prosper yourself uh, on earth here, if, if that is indeed your goal. So in America, though, the dark side of capitalism and the free market is when money and materialism becomes the ultimate end game, when it's not so much about glorifying God or even elevating your own self-esteem, right? Because, you know, we had that thing years and years ago seeping into America culture, the participation trophies where everybody is patted on the head for doing mediocre jobs and those who excel were brought to the level of those who couldn't excel and they were all treated equally. And that's what uh, wayward teachers and misguided, um, you know, Americans told children uh, was the way of building their self-esteem which I don't even know how that works. I don't know how it builds self-esteem when you tell somebody who really sucks at something that they're good at something and then you create this false image in their own minds that they're good at something when they're not or vice versa when somebody's great at something and you tell them, eh, yeah, you may be great, but you, you have to stifle on that greatness for the good of others, for the good of the collective. So I, I don't even understand where that self-esteem movement came from. It, it Really, it's grounded in wickedness. But the true self-esteem comes from when you discover your talents that come from God and you are able and free to use those talents to, again, glorify God, to prosper yourself and family, to provide for yourself. But in America, the dark side of this free economy we have and this freedom we have is when people forget God, remove God from that equation, and instead their talents and their gifts come become all about making money, glorifying themselves with bigger homes, big, bigger, biggest mansions, cars, money, bank accounts, 401k, uh, prestigious items that they can show off to others and say, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at how great I am. So that's the dark side. And that sort of plays in to this question, right? The biblical question in Mark, what good is it if an individual gains the whole world, but loses his or her soul. So in order to keep your soul, in order to keep in line, in order to not simply gain materialism, materialistic goods, but in the meanwhile, lose your soul, you have to keep God, you have to keep God at the helm in society and in your family and in your mind and your heart, right? That's what reigns you in. That's what keeps you from be becoming this runaway, materialistic, greedy, or as Barack Obama might call it, fat cat capitalist, fat cat pig, or whatever he said. It's spoken like a spoken like a man, by the way, who never created anything in his life, who never did the hard work of building up a venture or business from ground zero and putting in blood and sweat and tears to make it work. Spoken like a man who spent his entire life earning at the hands of taxpayers or activist groups that saw that saw his potential for politics and wanted to grow him and groom him to eventually exploit him, which they did quite successfully, right? Barack Obama, say what you will, in terms of 
promoting a very anti-American agenda in eight years. He was very successful at that. He took America very far down a path where America never should have tread. And here we are now under Joe Biden with the uh, Biden whisperer, Barack Obama, in the background, pushing even further America down a path where we shouldn't tread. So back to what good is it if an individual gains the world but loses the soul? My guest today, Dr. Jennifer London, has a book that she is promoting called Profiles in Character, and it talks about great Americans, great Americans that we've all heard of, every single name in this book we've heard, we've heard of before, we've probably studied in American history or culture or discussed with our friends, discussed in college and classes in high school and so forth. But this book focuses on character. And I find that very endearing and important because what if you gain the world but lose your soul? And if your character is part of your soul and your character is what feeds your soul, then this seems a very crucial book to consider. So Dr. Jennifer London, I want to welcome you to Bold and Blonde. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I love the fact that your book that you co-wrote, I believe, uh, Profiles in Character, focuses on famous Americans, but their character, not so much what they did in life, but their character. Tell me why you chose that path. Well, actually, it was my husband. He was really the brains between this uh, initiative. Uh, he he emphasized character throughout his life, having attended the Naval Academy, uh, was a Navy aviator in the, in the Navy, and then went on to uh, build up a um, multi-million, 500 million, I mean, five, Fortune 500, uh, $6 billion company, a government contracting company that has uh, supported some of our country's most critical national security priorities called CACI International. And so he was always a patriot, um, and having been a former military person uh, and being in business, really felt character was very important. So he wrote a book in 2013 called Character, the Ultimate Success Factor, and this is just an extension of his interest in in the topic of character and, and feeling that our country has, uh, and many of our leaders have slipped in terms of their, uh, you know, focus on character and keeping our, the, you know, the moral high road. And so, so he actually came up with the idea of looking at uh, those people in American history who uh, made a, a big impact uh, on our country. And an additional factor was that our children, uh, we have triplets, uh, three boys, we felt didn't have good role models. I mean, there's social media influencers, athletes, entertainers. Uh, those are notable people. But in terms of real uh, serious accomplishments and historical achievements, uh, we he looked at history. So he actually chose the individuals in the book. There are 16. He started out with 12 and continued to add to this group and focused on a specific uh, character trait of each of those individuals that he felt really um, supported them during their difficult times and also uh, propelled their success. So I think it's a good read, and all of the, all of the um, proceeds go to military organizations. So there are little vignettes of each of these, char these individuals, from Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, all the way to Billy Graham and uh, Ronald Reagan. So when we say that somebody really has character, how do you define that? Well, he defined it as a unique set of moral and ethical uh, traits, uh, what you believe in, what you stand for, what you expect from others. And, I mean, character, you know, you can have good character, uh, also not good character. Uh, and, you know, so on the one side, unethical, dishonest, uh, versus someone who is, um, you know, ethical, trustworthy. And so he defined, you know, good character as those unique uh, traits that an individual has. And he felt that those really did support success. And I think certainly they create the foundation 
for a good society as well. I mean, a, a viable society. It, it must be a, a tough sell in today's modern America because you could have the best character in the world, but it doesn't necessarily lead to the riches that Americans are conditioned to strive for at an early age. Well, it is a challenge. Um, a recent survey of 18 to 30 year olds uh, showed that there are four things uh, that they need that they need to get them engaged in something. So to try to uh, promote character, ac accountability, ethics, and so on, uh, you know, you're confronted with those four things, which are uh, what is in it for me, who else is going to be involved, will I fit in, and what will I get out of it? So I hear a lot of I in those, um, you know, conditions, I guess, that, that this uh, generation is looking for to get involved and to, to, to engage. And the younger generation does not subscribe to what, uh, you know, the older generations do in terms of hard work, sacrifice, delayed gratification. Um, and they, a lot of them opt to live with parents, uh, to prioritize personal pursuits over work. And so there is a bit of a challenge. I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great. Our younger generations have, you know, grown up in America with more privileges than, I mean, my parents who grew up during the Great Depression and had to go through a lot of sacrifice. And then, you know, the, 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 the greatest generation, World War II, the baby boomers, you know, trying to build, um, you know, their lives and careers. So, um, so it's a challenge, um, but, it, you know, it can be a game changer for people to, um, to you know, to, to have good character and dignity. Uh, I think it's essential for, for achieving success. Do you think it, all younger people tend to be more about the I, right? All about themselves. I, I, I would say, I mean, I haven't done a survey or anything on this, but it just seems to me that youth are naturally drawn toward themselves and not thinking of others first. But as they grow older, do, do, do they naturally grow into a more mature look at society, what they can do for society, not for themselves? Or is that something that has to be specifically trained? Well, I think it's a combination of both, but, but economics does come into play. I mean, you know, younger people aren't always self-sufficient. Um, the survey that was done that I, that I just referred to, uh, it's based on their own feedback. So the I that comes through, the I, me that comes through in there is based on, you know, self-identification, you, know, uh, you know, their own feedback. But I, I agree with you that as people get older and mature and are basically put into situations of working with others, uh, having families, and, um, you know, becoming part of a larger community, I think they do recognize that there is a need for, um, you know, being trustworthy, having good ethics, and, you know, really getting along. I think we have lost dignity. Uh, I don't see it emphasized. I don't see it demonstrated. I mean, even with our leaders, some of the behavior and language that we see is just, um, you know, not what we would consider good uh, role models for our, for our children. But um, I do think that um, that uh, our young people will recognize if they have a mindset for good character, they will see it as essential for achieving a, a success and also enhancing their resiliency um, as they go through life. I, I think people maybe are drawn to it as well, because I think of, just think of Hollywood for a second, right? Everything that comes out of Hollywood is rot and cultural decay. But what stands out is when you hear about the Hollywood couples who have stayed married for 30, 40 years, right? And that, that's a sign of character right there. Yeah, character, commitment. And, you know, I am a big fan of old movies. You yes. Know, old 30s, 40s, 50s, old black and white movies. I mean, the behavior in those movies, uh, and again, you know, it's Hollywood, is so different than what we see today. I mean, our movies today, I have to, you know, be very selective in what I, I let my children watch because there's a lot of sensationalism, there's a lot of gratuitous sex, 
violence, language, and I, I had the pleasure of sitting next to someone who um, ran one of, you know, headed up one of the large uh, motion picture um, organizations, and I asked that question: Why are movies today so, uh, you know, full of all of this? Um, uh, you know, as you mentioned, and as I mentioned, you know, dramatic uh, sensationalism that isn't always, you know, what we want our kids to see. And basically, he said. It, that's what sells, and it, it has a universal, which I thought was interesting. He said an, it has an, in, a universal um, interest, which means that re, it reaches a wider audience. But uh, I think older movies tended to try to depict a good moral to the story, uh, a, a plot that 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 uh, illustrated a, a good lesson, you know, to be learned and to be emulated and. I don't see that in our movies today. So, um, but I do think that, you know, going back to these couples in Hollywood, Hollywood used to be more elegant. Now it's just glitzy. I mean, there is a difference. And, um, again, that elegance and that, um, you know, carrying oneself with a sense of good character and and, um, and being a good role model, I think we, we're, we're hard-pressed to find that. You say glitzy, I guess I would say trashy, but I, I, I agree. So uh, I'm looking at your, your um, list of 16 profiles in the book Profiles in Character, and uh, I want to get to some of the specific names, but the question pops in my mind, does character always have to be born out of struggle or challenge? Because certainly these people, Jefferson, Washington, Reagan, Harriet Tubman, and even Billy Graham, that is profiled in your book, Profile and Character, they all came from struggle. Mm-hmm. Are the two tied together? I would say no. I think that when, uh, you know, I'll go back to the family, the importance of family. I think families can inspire the character. And, uh, you know, I would say that uh, it has, um, you know, he he had those role models in his in his family growing up. Uh, you know, in in Oklahoma with his parents who had their own businesses, and demonstrated that um, his growing up. You know, his experience growing up didn't wasn't necessarily one that was punctuated by uh, great adversity, but but character was definitely instilled in him. And same with the Naval Academy, being in the Navy working with others in the military, supporting our country. So I would say no, uh, it's not necessary. And some people who go through adversity don't develop good character. Um, you know, we can look at some of the dictators and world leaders who uh, that I won't mention, but, uh, you know, they had adversity and, and it took them in a dark place. So I think, I think that these are people that found the right path. and But they didn't always have... I mean, some some of them chose opposing paths. For instance, our book also profiles Robert E. Lee. Yet it also includes Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. Uh, these are people that took opposing paths. But during and Robert E. Lee is under a lot of um, uh, scrutiny and and um, uh, is excoriated in, in many respects in our society. But during his lifetime, his character was never in question. He never got any demerits when he was at West Point. He was actually the first choice to lead the, the Union Army. But Lee struggled with the idea of fighting against his people. When Virginia seceded, uh, he had to make a hard choice, uh, which ultimately became the most consequential of his life. And um, and so we see that his, his character trait of loyalty to his state of Virginia um, and to his people um, is an admirable trait, uh, character trait, but it had, it, had, it had ultimately long-term consequences for him. During his lifetime, he, after you know, he surrendered with dignity, he worked to um, you know, reconcile um, and to bring the country together. He worked for that. That was his, his goal. Uh, unfortunately, his citizenship was never restored. Um, he didn't. He he opposed secession and he did not support slavery, but um, he has been, you know, painted with a different brush in recent years. And yet, there are three or four presidents who who praised Lee, um, including Eisenhower, um, Teddy Roosevelt. One hundred and fifty thousand people came to uh, the dedication of his statue in Richmond. 
that papers in the North um, uh, praised him as well, because again, it was his character that that they that they looked to, uh, and yet he had chosen a, an opposing path to someone like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. You know, Harriet Tubman was audacious in her efforts to free uh, over se- you know seventy slaves. She was free herself, but she went back and she was bringing them into the North. I think, I think there's a lot to be learned about the Civil War, and I think a lot of people really haven't delved deep enough into it to understand the people and the times to really grasp what it was about mm-hmm. and appreciate it, or understand, I should say, understand it in, uh, in its entirety. I, I agree. It just becomes too divisive in this country to even talk about it anymore. But uh, I know we only have a minute or two left, but maybe you could finish up by talking about either the character of Susan B. Anthony or Amelia Earhart that are profiled in, in your book, Profiles and Character. Well, I wish I could talk about both of them. Because Go ahead. <laughs> sure. Well, I will focus on Amelia Earhart because I think I think she's a role model that we can look to today. She really broke barriers in a, in a world dominated by men, but and she and she forged a path for women. But I I you know look to Amelia Earhart for the fact that she really competed against herself. She always wanted to reach a higher goal and beat her last you know to exceed beyond her her previous record. And I think that's just such a great trait to have as an individual. To really, you know, continue to to raise the bar on yourself, and again, I think you know she's so important in a world today where we're you know questioning what a woman is. I think both Susan B. Anthony, uh, who worked for you know the women's right to to uh, to vote, and Amelia Earhart, who who goes down in history as one of the greatest women aviators, I think they would both be scratching their head wondering what has happened in this world today uh, when we're questioning what a woman is. That's a really good point. It's sort of a sad, thought-provoking point as well. And I assume people can get your book, Profiles and Character, anywhere, yes? They can get it on Amazon and Barnes & Noble um, online, and um, you know, I hope that they'll pick it up. It's a great, there's a coffee table version, uh, there's, there's a great holiday gift, and a, and a uh, paperback version, which is very versatile. Uh, and uh, I will mention again that all proceeds from those books go to military organizations. What a great cause. Dr. Jennifer London, it was great chatting with you. I thank you for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure character. Isn't that what is so often missing in today's culture? I want to thank you for listening. Remind you, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, at washingtontimes.com, at Real Life Network, and of course, wherever podcasts are offered. Tune in next time, and in the meanwhile, don't forget, stay blunt, stay bold.